believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. So on Easter, uh, Christ rose from the dead, and that has that that has God the Father now has declared objectively the forgiveness of sins. And when uh, we hear that good news, we are we receive the benefit of that forgiveness. Because of that forgiveness, we forgive one another. And so there's no problem in uh, forgiving one another their sins. You can do that uh, within the family, uh, sibling, uh, say the words, I'm sorry. In particular, there is in the, in the pastoral office, though, uh, a forgiveness that is given individually and personally. And so, especially when there are sins which trouble us, we can go to the pastor privately, individually, uh, confess our sins, and hear for our own selves the forgiveness of sins. Sometimes that is called um, uh, individual confession absolution, holy absolution, whatever it might be. And on Sunday morning, there is what's called the general confession and absolution for everyone. But still, the words that we hear, uh, I forgive you, are uh, given for us as a source of gospel and comfort. And so may that gospel of forgiveness continue to come to us always. Amen. Any guests who, who any guests with us? I see Terry C Costello. She's a, a recent new member. And so if you uh, introduce yourself to her sometime, uh, Kelly Counts' mother. Otherwise, I don't see any guests. Uh, oh, um, Brenda's brother. Uh, tip my tongue. What's your name? Dan. Yeah, Dan. So Dan is here. Welcome. Greetings. So uh, I, I see Phyllis is coming in, too. So all right. Welcome. Um, fold your hands and let us pray. Heavenly Father, during this Sunday school Bible study hour, we ask that you bless us with the Holy Spirit to give us faith to trust in Christ as our Savior. We rejoice in the many gifts you give to us in both body and soul. Continue to be with us now and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sunday school, you're excused. And um, uh, Mrs. Walmer, I'm not for sure if uh, Jesse Lavasser is the door, the art room is open, if you can uh, please take care of that, thank you. A couple announcements. Um, we have a member in our congregation who's going to be turning 105. His name is uh, Erwin Grossens. I visit him in the nursing home, actually outside, uh, six feet apart. But my devotion and the communion service is all printed out, kind of large print, and he really enjoys it. His wife died about a year ago, a uh, year ago, March. Anyways, uh, um, Mary Alpha Shirod has put together some uh, birthday cards, and they even have the address, and they have the stamp. <laughs> so uh, I encourage, you're invited to take one, uh, Sign it. You can sign your name, or you can just sign it uh, a, uh, a member of Faith Within Church, whatever. But uh, uh, it's, it's, it's nice what, what Mary has done. Um, John, you want to? If you want one, raise your hand. If you want one, one for family. Thank you. <coughs> the other announcement is this coming Saturday. We have. Uh, uh, the free conference, and um, Reverend Roy Askins will be here, so please come, please come. It will be live, our YouTube uh, channel, but we want you to, we want you to come. Um, I think that's, 
about all the announcements. All right, today uh, we're going to be talking quite a bit about the word call or called, okay? So the, the um, just as an introduction, the Greek word is kaleho, and so, and, and so the word vocation comes from this Greek word kaleho. It's used in several different contexts. Uh, there's several different meanings depending on the context. Um, with a personal object to call anyone, invite, or summon, it is used particularly of the divine call to partake of the blessings of redemption. We'll be talking about that. Uh, that definition. Also, it's used with, uh, in association with very off some offices, and we'll be, we'll be looking at that in particular. All right, chapter eight. We got the questions. The questions should be uh, by the aisles or whatever. Question number one. In Luther's small catechism, we confess the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. St. Paul says, God called you through our gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 14. He also says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. So in that context, Luther's uh, the, the use of this word in Luther's small catechism, the use of this word in 2 Thessalonians 2 or 1 Corinthians 1, uh, what does it mean to be called? The Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. That's a famous phrase we've memorized. Flesh that out. What does that mean? What did the Holy Spirit do? What? Faith. Okay. Uh, I would say the verb that I would use is brought us to faith. Okay. Uh, gave us faith. And so the word called is in the context of faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit did something to us and for us in regarding uh, bringing us into uh, God's kingdom in giving us faith. Any other uh, responses, Ruth? Yes, and we will, the next question is what did God use to call us to faith in Christ? So hold on to that, 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 that. good, good question. Yes, Jacob. I have a yes. Is this kind of uh, precedes the whole divinity theology? I don't e about that in my yes. Yes. Thank you. So, as Lutherans, we do not use the language, we made a decision for Christ. Um, what's the other one? I found Christ. Um, I welcomed him into my heart. I welcomed him into my heart. Yes. And, and the problem with that language is that. Uh, we are doing something, whereas in this context of these Bible passages and what Luther talks about is the Holy Spirit has done something, you see. And also to tie along with that is, uh, in the context of Luther's uh, third article, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord to come to him. Why? Because we are sinful by nature. The Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. You see, and so before this phrase that Luther uses, uh, it's the phrase, I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord to come to him. So you're right. Uh, as the scriptures clearly talk about conversion is done by the Holy Spirit and not on our part. So good point. 
Anything, anyone else? Yes, Kate? You're right, and so in the dictionary for kaleho has the word summon. And so you've been, you've been summoned, called, what? Named, yes, uh, and, and that's, that's the context there. Um, my notes here say uh, enables to believe, the Holy Spirit enables us to believe, my notes here say that the Holy Spirit brought us to faith in Christ. So this is the uh, uh, this is the language here. Any other comments and thoughts? Yes. Um, when, when you talk about calling, you're, you're talking about overcoming the wickedness, right? We're, at some point, this will feel far away from God, and, and God calls us to Himself. Yeah, that's another usage of the word "call." Is uh, Eric? Could you come up here? <laughs> Eric, can you hear me? You see, and so that's a different usage of this Greek word. Um, but in the context of conversion, it's clearly the Holy Spirit is doing the converting, bringing us to faith. Now, I think the book talks about when an unbeliever hears the gospel, hears the word of God, um, then the Holy Spirit that is somewhat of a, involves the hearing. So Eric, uh, can, can you come here? You are hearing the, 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 the calling of your name, and also when the Holy Spirit, we're gonna get the next question, uses the word in the gospel, uh, there is hearing, and faith comes by hearing. So that's all in the good context of uh, the, the word there. So thank you, yeah. Okay, I do wanna get on to question number two. And I already answered this, and you know it's an easy answer too as well, but do want to talk about it. What did God use to call you to faith in Christ? Uh, Veith mentioned it on page 119, but also there's some Bible passages here. And let me read through them. I've got them printed out, and you just you answer the question. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Next one, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And finally, 1 Peter 1, 23. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. My notes also talk about Isaiah 55, where God's word accomplishes that for which God has sent it. And the last one, also, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. So this is all involved. So after having said that, what did God use to call you to faith in Christ? The Word of God, the Gospel. Yeah, and uh, the author talks about Romans 10, where how can I... You hear unless someone is preaching, right? And we're going to get to the pastoral office here a little bit later. But the point is, is that the word is is proclaimed. Uh, I would also add too, as well, um, by means of baptism. So you got the word of God, you've got the gospel. The gospel is in baptism too, as well. I do want to read something on page one nineteen, the top of page one nineteen. Let me read the first full paragraph there. A Christian, then, is someone who is, has heard and believed the gospel. That is to say, someone who has been called to faith by the word of God. The calling is not just a subjective experience, which Jacob had mentioned, nor some inner voice. Rather, it comes from outside the self to the self. And I think that's a, that's a good point there. Any comments? Any other thoughts? On a, kind of a sideline on that, so faith is a gift. It's not anything that we've created, anything that we shape, anything that it's a, is a gift, a gift from God. Anything else? Okay. Question number three. St. Peter says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Kind of what Eric was talking about. What did God call you out of, and what did he call you into? Out of the sinful world, to use the language of this verse though, out of darkness, okay? And what has he called you into? Light. And it kind of, Eric mentions, it's from one place to another place, and that's a, that's a, good, uh, a good way of putting it. Out of darkness and into light. Um, and um, also, he says, we are not, we once were not a people, but now we are God's people. Um, so we are a royal priesthood. We are the baptized. We are sheep within his fold. Um, we are uh, the bride of Christ. We are... Um, we are the branches grafted into the vine. So when you talk about uh, the one true church, only those who believe, uh, they are ones who are now in God's kingdom, in his fold. They, they have faith in Christ. And so this is who we are. Uh, this, is, this is who we are by God's, by God's grace, by his power, the gospel, and, and, and all of that. Any comments? Yes, ma'am. From darkness into light implies that we're going to see things that we didn't see before. You know, that we're going to, you know, we're going to perceive perhaps, you know, the needs of our neighbor in a way that we were blind to before. Yeah, and uh, yes, good point, is that we now see the needs of our neighbor. We are, the, lo the, the gospel has, has had its way with us. We are changed now for the better. Uh, we are lights in a dark world. We confess uh, Christ as our Savior. We receive his gifts. We respond to him with thanksgiving. Our life is now different than, um, than, the, than the life of the world. Yeah, good point. I could say more on 1 Peter 2. This is the famous one talking about uh, a royal priesthood and, and, and so forth, a holy nation. Uh, why? That you may proclaim the excellence of, of Christ who called you out of darkness. There's so much more in this verse, uh, but I wanted to emphasize the going from one realm into another realm uh, by means of the gospel. And, um, okay. Moving on, question number four. What is the one calling that all of us have in common. What is the one calling that all those through faith have in common? Caleb? Faith in Christ. Faith in Christ. So class, not class. <laughs> I always say that teaching in the school, sorry. Uh, so, there are different stations in life and different vocations, but there's one thing that we all have in common, and that is faith in Christ, the call uh, to believe, and then the called have faith toward God and love toward the neighbor. So when we, we can talk about a past event, what God did for us, through the gospel, and then we can talk about a present reality in who we are in, uh, in terms of the baptized, uh, those who believe, and then we also can talk about uh, the future, uh, the kingdom of glory in heaven and above for, all, for those who, who believe. So I was baptized, I am a baptized child of God, and that will carry me over into, into the future. And so also the word call or called is also used in this context too as well. I meant to look up, a, can you, uh, Romans, 
just wait. I, I was going to include Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. But let me look at real quick. Because it talks about past, present, and future. Let me see. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And then it goes on to say, and those who were he justified, he also glorified. I know the author uses this verse, uh, and um, I, didn't, I didn't bring it up, because I didn't want any, anybody to ask me about what does predestination mean. <laughs> but I brought it up. But the book says he doesn't want to go down that road either. Uh, no, no, the word, I shouldn't be uh, uh, sarcastic like that. Um, uh, God predestined the, those to believe. And nowhere in Scripture does it ever talk about God predestined um, those not to believe. And that's what Calvin, Calvin taught. But in Romans 8, it, the, the word, the, the, um, there's the past, what he, he foreknew, there's a present, he called, and then there's the future, uh, those who he called are justified and then will receive glory. And that's my only reason why in, uh, uh, in Romans, Romans 8 is the sense of, like uh, Eric mentioned, moving from one realm to the other. So, when, we, when I ask the question, I've got to ask another question here is, wait, let me see. Yeah. As a baptized believer in Christ, what is our calling? What, what does God want us to do? Since we all have, since we're, we are all the baptized and all have faith in Christ, Scripture is very clear. Faith toward God and love toward the neighbor. It's very simple. Faith toward God and love toward the neighbor. And then how are you going to flesh out that love to the neighbor? Then we can talk about very various stations in life and, 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 and positions and, and, um, and all of that. And you can use the word vocation in that context as well. So... The, 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 the highest point, if you're going to talk about a, a pyramid, the point of the top, we are all called through faith in Christ. And that's what we have in common. Uh, love God and love the, the, love the neighbor. Now, next, next, uh, next time, well, I'll flesh that out, out more of that next time. But that's, so any questions, comments so far? You understand? The, yes. Yes, we are called out of darkness. We are the baptized who believe that are in his kingdom. And I'm gonna, we're going to talk about what the baptized are called to do within a congregation. And so um, you had mentioned in the context of uh, the body of Christ. And we're going to, again, we're going to get to... Uh, a more narrow view in terms of uh, different offices within, within a congregation. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Question five. St. Paul says to the church in Rome, quote, Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle. That's verse one. Then verse seven reads this. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Now notice, the word called here at Kaleho is used in, in the, 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 ob, uh, the, the object or purpose is different. So, here's the question. What does St. Paul have a call to and what do the believers in the church at Rome have a call to? First of all, what does St. Paul, what does St. Paul have a call to? 
to be an apostle. Do the baptized at the church in Rome have a call to be an apostle? Yes or no? No. Okay, according to Romans 1 verse 7, what do the baptized at the church in Rome have a call to? Saints. Okay, what does the word saints mean? What? Holy, holy one. Sanctified. Sanctified, yes. So we are saints, holy, because of the blood of Christ, given the free gift of faith in Christ. We are, uh, we are lights in a dark world. So, um, now let me ask, so let me ask you another question. Is Paul included in the call to be a saint? Yes. St. Paul. Paul. <laughs> My point, we're, we're now we're starting to distinguish differences in office, okay? And that's what I'm leading to, differences in office. Paul has a call to an office, namely apostleship. And we saw his conversion and his call in Acts chapter, what is it, 16, uh, where he, uh, on the road to Damascus, uh, God converted him and called him to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so, um, so that is very clear, very evident. And, and, uh, and yet the believers in Rome uh, were called by the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit had brought them to faith in Christ. And so the baptized now as holy ones live out toward faith in God and love toward the neighbor. And Paul is included in that too as well. Um, all of us are included in that. And that's the, uh, that's the office that is in the wide sense in terms of, I always refer, I always say the baptized, the baptized who believe. And um, again, my, uh, the, uh, any comments, uh, any question? Yes. Yeah, uh, for many, people get worried about predestination, and they oftentimes wonder and worry, uh, I who believe, am I, am I uh, predestined or not? And the problem with Calvin is, Calvin will say, uh, look at your works. If you do good works, then you are predestined. And the problem with that is, is you're pointing to some kind of work that you are doing rather than the gift of faith that God has given. And I am baptized. God has given me faith in Christ. I rejoice in the gospel. And so that's a Lutheran response that we don't, talk about predestination from the realm of works, but we rejoice in the gospel that God has given to us in Christ. And so that's, it, it, the predestination is also very similar to the article of justification, that God has justified us, declared us righteous um, because of what Christ has done. God, in his grace and mercy toward us sinners, sent his only begotten son. And through the cross and resurrection, there is, uh, uh, we, we are justified. He justifies the ungodly. Uh, we benefit that through faith. And so that, the, 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 those two uh, teachings are very, very similar and uh, support each other. So, yes.
Yes. Yes, and uh, very good, Richard. And uh, to summarize things, God wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So we cannot say to our unbelieving neighbor, uh, well, he, uh, he lives an immoral life. I think that God has predestined him to damnation. And so therefore, I'm not going to share the gospel with him. You see, that's dangerous thinking. And that's kind of, that's the dangerous thing about uh, Calvin. But uh, if God wants all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, then I'm going to talk to my unbelieving neighbor uh, about Christ. And um, the unbelieving neighbor then comes to faith in Christ, and, 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 and we rejoice in his life of repentance and faith in Christ. His life has changed for the better. But if uh, someone who believes, uh, and Scripture is very clear that the gospel is and can uh, and, and, and is rejected, and so there are some who are baptized, believe, and they willfully reject the gospel and are, 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 are of unbelief. And then there is damnation. And so uh, the encouragement is for us always to believe the gospel goes out to all people, to all nations, and, and we, leave it, we leave it at that. So good point. Yes, Meryl? Did God foreknow that Adam and Eve would eat the forbidden fruit? Yes, he foreknew that. Even from the foundation of the world. Because he knew from the foundation of the world to send his son to redeem fallen mankind. God foreknew that. He knows, he knows all things. Yes. Uh, yeah, John? Just because he foreknew that Adam and Eve were going to eat the fruit, it does not mean that that was God's will. No. So we have to be careful in saying that. But um, so just God's foreknowledge does not necessarily mean his will. Um, and uh, so that, yeah, that's. Well, let me just put it this way. Um, there are things that are revealed to us in Scripture, and that's what we go on. There are some things that are not given to us by God, and we are not to guess what he thinks and his will and his way. Uh, we are justified by grace through faith in Christ. We rejoice in his gospel, and we do pray thy will be done. He is our Heavenly Father who cares for us and loves us. And we live each day by God's grace and mercy. And if even in trial and tribulation, he does still care for us. And that's where, that's where we as his children um, follow him through faith, knowing that all things will work out together for good in the end. So I, I do want to move on. So no more questions. Uh, please, I do want to move on. And we're kind of getting off topic, but that's, yeah. All right. Question number, what are we, where are we at? Six. Six. 
The pastoral office is a divine institution. God gave to the church, quote, shepherds and teachers, uh, Ephesians 4. It's the same, the word and there means uh, pastors are both. Uh, the pastor oversees a flock entrusted to his care. That's Acts chapter 20. Pastors are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, 1 Corinthians 4. God calls a man through a congregation. God works through a pastor. What is a pastor called to do? Okay, uh, there's a list here. So first of all, proclaim the word of God. What is another one of Pray, pray for his people. What's another one? Shepherd his people. That's a wide, wide term. Uh, sacraments. Okay, so now you got baptize and administer the Lord's Supper. You mention what? Preach or teach the Word of God. Someone mentioned prayer. Another one would be absolve sins. And so when you. Um, in the Lutheran agenda, when you look at the, the ordination or the installation of a pastor, these specific things are mentioned, okay? Are these things that are given to the pastor uh, given to the layperson to do also? No. So now what we're doing, you remember earlier I distinguished the difference between apostleship and a baptized believer. There is now a difference between what a pastor is called to do and when we talk about, we'll get into a lay person and their, their office in terms of, um, in this context too as well. So very top of the pyramid, uh, every one of us, are, we are the baptized, called, to have faith toward God and love toward the neighbor. Now going down the pyramid, we have various offices. This chapter is about uh, God's work uh, in the church, all right? So that's why we're talking about things within the church. And then we can go another step in terms of uh, various vocations in, in family, society, government, and everything else like that. But uh, in particular, the pastor is called to baptize, teach, absolve sin, preach, administer the Lord's Supper, protect the flock from false doctrine, visit the sick and the dying, pray, and, 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 and all of that. Um, any, any question on that? Yes, Kate? Yeah, so in Romans 13, uh, government officials are clearly called servants of God. And, and in, in, the, in the church, the pastor is also called a steward, ser, a servant and a steward. Different realms, yes. Different realms, different purposes, and different responsibility. Yeah, so last week we did look at the... Uh, the, uh, as it was chapter 7, talked about the calling within, uh, well, as citizen, but also within government officials. So, yes, you're, um, okay. Got any questions so far on that? Now, where are we at? Question number 7. Jesus said, the one who hears you hears me. Explain what Gene Veith means when he says it is Christ who is preaching, baptizing, presiding at his supper, and in the deepest sense, ministering to his people through the earth, is that a typo over there? Earthen vessel of the pastor. Or is it earthly vessel? It should be. A, is it earthen? Is that page 123? Okay, earthen vessel of the pastor. So explain what he is saying there in that quotation. Right, so um, we could go to the small catechism. Uh, 
But the word, the word of absolution that the pastor says, notice he says called and ordained. You got the word called. Uh, and, then as, uh, and then also um, stands in the stead by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the command is uh, to the apostles, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. And so when we hear that absolution, it is as if Christ were standing there. Uh, now, obviously, you know, there's times when I'll be in, um, in investments and uh, um, a little three-year-old would say, oh, there's Jesus. Now, that's, <laughs> you know, that's, you, we all will laugh at that and stuff like that. But in their mind, they know that this man here is, um, is, is, is a man of God. But is the pastor Jesus? No, not Jesus incarnate, to be sure. But when the pastor uh, preaches the word of God, how do we regard preaching? How do we regard teaching? How do we regard the, what about baptism? What about the administration of the Lord's Supper? So um, any thoughts and comments on that? Representative. Representative of, yes. Uh, standing in the set of, yes, Matt? Well, when we're called out of darkness into light, maybe that's one of the things we see is that Christ is the actor, that Christ is serving us through the man. That's, that's not obvious to someone who's outside the church. Yeah, and so we could say that God is working through the farmer to provide daily bread. God is using uh, the father for the sake of the family. God uses people for the sake of the neighbor. We could also say that God is working through the pastor for the sake of the people. You see that? And uh, that's... Um, it's, a little, it's a little different, though, because, you know, God serves us through the farmer, whether the farmer is a Christian or not. Right. You know, the pastor right. is kind of in a more special position you know, more direct representative of Christ. However, if the word for harmony is pastor, it must be worship of God. And the word of God is for harmony. Right. right. If there is a, a pastor who should be removed for false doctrine uh, and, and, and yet the baptism that he performs or the Lord's Supper that he administers is still valid and efficacious. And that's, that's a good point. All right, any other questions? On, yes, Caleb? Yeah, yeah, the response would be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not Jesus in the flesh. Uh, he works through me for your sake and, and, I, and things like that. You know, we all laugh because three-year-olds, you know, all they think sometimes. But, yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah God is at work uh, through this man. Right. Okay. Question number eight. Uh, the 12 disciples said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. That's Acts 16. And here's a quote from uh, the book. Page 125. So the church elected seven qualified laymen to handle the practical, even secular matters the church was dealing with, so that the 12 could spend t their time in, quote, prayer and the ministry of the word. Gene V said that it is wrong to act outside one's vocation. What is wrong with a pastor serving as CEO slash president? and the people doing the work of the ministry. What's wrong with that? You're reversing roles. Yes, and so our confession is very clear in Article 14 that um, no one should preach or administer the sacraments unless there's a proper call. And it's unfortunate that in some situations we have a, a lay person consecrating the Lord's Supper, um, and, and that's a whole other story. But the pastor himself has to be careful that he doesn't uh, present himself as, as a CEO slash president. 
He is a servant uh, and a steward of the mysteries, the sacraments. But uh, even, even in our structure here, um, you know, we have a, a president, vice president, we have various offices, and, and rightly so. We're going we're gonna to talk about them here in the next question. But we don't reverse, uh, reverse roles in regarding uh, uh, work, in the, work in the church. Some, uh, the, 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 there's a, the church growth uh, movement said that the pastor can train people to do things on Sunday morning to where he sits in the back pew and watches. That's bad theology. That's bad theology. Yes, Ruth? Yes, some of the mega churches you'll see uh, uh, pastors, Jim and Rachel Welmer. <laughs> and Rachel's shaking her head no. <laughs> but it's interesting you see that they will also identify the guy's wife as, quote, pastor. Or some of the mega churches, yeah, they, they, uh, they see him as a CEO. And, uh, and he's got to be a, a man of God, in, 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 uh, particularly in regarding the gospel and the sacraments. Okay, any other thoughts and comments on that? Yes. I think the impulse behind that, a lot of sort of a democratic, you know, everybody gets to participate, everybody gets a job, and then everybody will feel special. Everybody gets to take a turn reading the scripture, and then they'll feel important, they'll feel more special. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah. it's well-intentioned, but it's misguided. Yeah, yeah. Um, well-intentioned, misguided. They, they want to make everybody feel good. They also want to put pastor and lay people on the same level regarding vocation. And as, as, it, as we went through, there is, there is a difference. And I um, don't want to get into a hot topic, but what do you think about lay people reading the lessons? And we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> it is in uh, churches, I know that. And anyways, uh, you can talk to Pastor Taylor about that one. So, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, unfortunately, well, on that line, uh, there are congregations that have women elders, uh, women administering uh, the Lord's Supper and, and various things like that. So it's, um, but Matt, Matt's got a good point is they try to level the playing field and make everybody feel um, feel welcomed and, and, and all that. Okay, I do want to move on. We've got two more questions here. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, unfortunately, in Missouri Synod uh, congregations, that happens. So. All righty. Uh, question nine. St. Paul says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For the, you don't you know, see the various verses there, there, I just kind of split them up. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. At Faith Within Church, there are various roles within the church that take up uh, different members equipped to perform them. List the numerous positions of people who serve or help out just on Sunday morning, um, excluding the pastoral office. Who are the people that assist on Sunday morning uh, apart from the office of holy ministry? So what are the list of them? Ushers. Who else? Acolytes. Acolytes. Who else? Organist. Organist. What? Uh, altar guild. Yes, altar guild. Sunday school teachers. Sunday school teachers. Yes. So you, you see that we are one body, but there are many members. So just on Sunday morning, it takes, uh, there's a lot of people involved. And praise God for that. And we thank God for that. And, and, and you, are, you are contributing to the, the, to, to the, um, the administration of the gospel, and, and we're thankful for that. 
Uh, one more question here. Oh, any questions or thoughts on that? Uh, 10, list the various congregation offices, personnel, and volunteer positions at Faith Lutheran Church. Uh, I'm not going to have you list them. I've got a list of them, and I'm going to go through them. It's, it's a long list. But regarding elected officials, I counted them. There are 47. You can write this down if you want. There are 47 people who are elected to various positions. As far as the school, where I have full-time and part-time, headmaster and secretary, there are 18 people that are involved in the school. Regarding the church, um, there's two pastors, Pastor uh, uh, Kieser also, there are secretaries. Um, there is the Sunday school. Uh, let's see, uh, also, there's uh, men of faith. There's three officers. Women of faith, five officers. Organists, there are five of them. There's choir directors, choirs, six of them. There are youth group leaders, Thrive and Care and Congregation, Sunday school superintendent, a secretary, and many, and many teachers. So the point being is I added up, there are roughly 80 to 100 people involved in God's work here at Faith Lutheran Church. And praise God for that. And the point being is, again, uh, there are many members that serve in their own way and time. But you take anyone that is not in, in office or serving in any way, you are serving by your singing, by uh, the offering that you give, by the confession of your faith. And so on Sunday morning, uh, your confession and singing and contributions uh, help, help one another. To the, and, and, and so we are thankful for all that God has done and given us here. So in the, in the agenda, I looked up the, uh, when uh, officers are installed, it talks about so that all things should be done decently and in order. And also it goes on to talk about service is to the glory of God and not, you know, toward their own, their own um, uh, uh, attention. And also, not only, but notice nowhere in the installation of, of congregation officers does it talk about teach, uh, baptizing, uh, administering the Lord's Supper, preaching, none of that. It talks about working with the pastor to keep order in the church. Yes, Colin? Well, I mean, within the pastoral office, there's differences between senior associates is only for the sake of order. But both, as you know, consecrate, absolve, and are, in terms of office, uh, seen on a level, level playing field. Uh, and then as far as different offices in the church here, again, that's for the sake of order. And, and God is a God of order, and so um, there is the church council, and then you've got eight different boards, and you've got the different boards reporting to the church council, and, and, and then yet, but you also have men of faith, women of faith, so we are all uh, working together for the sake of God's kingdom here, but in particular, I would say in the elected offices, you've got the, uh, uh, the officers, there's five officers, president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, I can't remember the other one, financial secretary, is that the five? And then, uh, so, well, but ultimately, though, you've got voters in a democratic society that we have here, and the voters, there's two voters meetings a year, and they obviously hold, in terms of, uh, if you want to talk about power or you want to talk about decision making, they're the ultimate ones. So did I answer your question, Colin? Sort of. Uh, 
the pastor is viewed uh, as far as offering perhaps wisdom or guidance or advice, but never, never is a pastor really a decision maker. Uh, other than the voters meeting, I'm a member of the voters meeting, I'll vote at the voters meeting, but as far as a pastor, um, no, we don't have really a vote in really anything. So, uh, yes, Matt. And the way it works in reality is nobody, nobody issues orders. You know, no one is running the church by, you know, like exercise of earthly authority. The way it works in reality is we attempt to persuade each other. Yeah. And, you know, and, and come to a consensus on things, and that's why sometimes it can take a long time to make a decision. But, yeah. uh, you know, it's really a very, a very gentle style of leadership to use with each other. Yeah, and in that light, when the officers are installed, it does talk about harmony within the church, cultivating harmony among the members and promoting a general welfare of the congregation. And that's good words to use. And that is true. And, you know, uh, we're going to talk about next time uh, how we sin in our vocation and um, obviously we don't live in a a perfect church a perfect world and and even even all of us uh, we repent of our sins and God forgives us so um, but to to bring this to a close uh, we are thankful for um, first of all again we are all called as a baptized believer in Christ to have faith toward God love toward the neighbor there's the pastoral office that God has instituted uh, for the, the gifts of forgiveness, life and salvation for us. And there are many people that serve uh, to support that uh, teaching and preaching and administering the sacraments. And so that the gospel also will go out to all nations in terms of mission work, uh, mission work within the school and support of catechesis. So all of it is uh, uh, to the glory of God, that's why we serve. And uh, so may God continue to bless us and guide us in that way. Amen. Uh, one more note before we close in prayer. Uh, we might have Reverend Roy Askins speak during this hour. We might put back, push our fifth one to the first Sunday in February. We have a guest speaker here. Normally our free conference speakers fly out on Saturday. Uh, Roy Askins wants to be around here for one more day and, uh, and enjoy uh, father and mother and uh, brother and sister in Christ. So he flies out Sunday, what, Sunday afternoon, something like that? Yeah, so I didn't ask him yet, but since we do have a guest in town, he could talk about uh, Lutheran Witness, what it's like to be an editor of the Lutheran Witness. Uh, he's, he could talk about the mission field that he was in, but we'll, um, uh, we'll probably do that uh, next week. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this is the day which you have made. We rejoice and glad in it. We thank you for your gospel and sacraments. We thank you for giving us saving faith in Christ. Use us, we pray, as servants within your kingdom, all to your glory. And may your word go out to all nations. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much.